it's a bit lagging. Uh, three, two, one. Have you ever wondered why the proletariat revolution, where the proletariat never rose up against the um, class? That is because instead of people um, working together, uh, what actually happened was they just set manufacturing targets, they had peace work that people as uh, grouped together in groups, and then this is how they're able to divide and conquer the working population. They use things like promise of a promotion that never happens, right? And, and also the longer someone works, the more responsibility you have, the more they need a the job. And this is why the company oftentimes hold them accountable. This debate is about protecting workers' right versus the possible consequence of unemployment and lower wages that we're willing to fight for. Our argument is simple. First, why the current working condition is unfair. To, secondly, what um, does quiet quitting lead to? Why does it lead to working life balance and why is that so important? First of all, why the current working condition is largely unfair. This is important because if we prove that the current working condition is, is unfair, it harms the most vulnerable people, that all the benefits that opposition side have largely falls under the privileged group already. This, this is why um, this is a certain benefit that you credit us. First of all, this is likely to hurt women and the minority um, because that they are considered as inferior in the current status quo because they're unable to work furthermore. Because think about this, if you have to work until 10 to 11 p.m. when the public transport is, is about to go out, this means this has a lot of uh, public safety consequence. Or secondly, the narrative put upon them is they, they have to be caretakers um, in conservative area. This means they have to work two to three jobs. It's unlikely for them to work extra hours. The second group of people that this likely doesn't work is this unfair, for example, you have like Nepo babies right now. It's like your son of the CEO, for example. This is unfair to other workers. But other reasons, for example, living too far, people that are forced to take two or three jobs mean that's largely unfair. Compared to male, these are the people that are not constrained by the social narrative. By, by them returning late means that they're probably a good breadwinner. Secondarily, I think that in the status quo, they have information asymmetry. Bosses act actively disencourage uh, people to ask each other wages. They might actually force workers to give them two weeks notice, um, or else they're going to threaten to give them a negative recommendation. But third of all, oftentimes things like improvement of um, of benefits don't happen because of non-disclosure agreements, union busting. This oftentimes means bad information about the company doesn't go out. Uh, given that, why do we think this is an important mechanism? I think that quiet quitting is, is important because it's oftentimes very hard to catch someone quiet quitting, right? The company oftentimes cannot observe a worker 24-7. It has additional costs for them. This is basically a principal agent problem. Uh, workers can oftentimes rent out the frustration through websites like Rate My Boss and also things like informal reputation. Over time, the company discovered that they had a loss of productivity and a loss of good employers and also workers alike. This, this is why um, companies will oftentimes try to increase the amount of uh, training put upon them, the amount of like welfare, the benefits that they have. And this is why this is something that's good. How does actually quiet quitting happen? This is probably going to happen because people are now going to just simply clock out after nine to five. They're not going to re respond after to work. Um, this means that you have increased sense of boundary. People can switch off afterwards. But secondly, job description is also going to change. Companies will have to explicitly write down the skills that they require, whether or not socialization is required after work. And the working hours and compensation will be clearly stated. We believe that um, information alone um, gives the workers a fair fighting chance, and that is a good thing. But third of all, I also think there's going to be competition because competition companies wants to have uh, compete for um, competent workers. They want workers to be productive. This is why they're going to reduce the, the specific workload put upon them. What is the benefit then? The first benefit is that on our side, you're going to be able to call out on the exploitation of the worker. Right. Um, the boss has to increase uh, some of the workers demand, even if they try union busting. The fact that um, these individuals are creating less bad profit for the company um, compared to the wage they're being given means that the company has to find other ways because they cannot just keep firing workers and keep hiring them and keep paying them uh, bonuses after they leave um, by, by firing them without a just cost. The second benefit is that this is going to change incentive to maximize the amount of exploitation by giving them a set amount of money beforehand and then just having them work infinite amount of time. Now, since the per hourly wage that you'll be able to get is lesser, this means that we'll try to have them work less in a short amount of time and try to give them training in order to increase the quality of service. 
This looks like on the job training, funding them to go to like camps to increase their knowledge and professional expertise, funded MBA. This looks like ranked ranked staff promotion, which means that they're gradually increasing in the amount of title they have and in which they have subsequently in order for them to beat inflation and increase productivity. Why is this a good thing? This is probably going to increase their mental and physical health. You have additional time to go to the gym when you have like additional seven hours above the time you need to sleep. You can develop hobbies. You can take your weekends off, right? You can play games or actually spend time with your family. All of these things I think is absolutely important. Why are these things so important? Because at the end of it, the reason why people work in the first place is so that we can save up money for retirement to do the things that we want. If we can actually prove that for the vast majority of people, they can already start enjoying their life during the 20s or 30s and not wait until the time when they're old and age, when people start dying around them, we believe that this is a unique benefit that, that they have, right? This bargaining power is actually something that is crucial on our side. Before I move on to preemption, I'll take POI. Three, two, one. See none. What are the kind of problems that oppositions are likely to, to point out. Firstly, they might point out that individuals are far more likely to improve. I think that this is unlikely to happen because this already prioritized privileged people, people who already um, can leave school without a student debt, they can already work longer hours, right? But the second reason why this is unlikely to happen is because of the fact there's no incentive for you to uh, keep working harder because like, even if you work additional 10, 10, uh, 10 times, you're unlikely to get a, a, a proportional increase in wages. They might also say that ah, companies are going to reward you with more stocks and promotion and benefit. I believe this is actually a bad thing because this is actually causing a more collective action problem, right? Because a, a very small set of people are able to get the benefit, whereas the vast majority of people don't get the promotion. They're going to get uncompensated overworked time. Josh, what I've proven at the end of the day is that the current employer-employee relationship is dysfunctional. It champions exploitation under the shackles of merit. On our side, we've proven to you that this is unfair. On our side, we've proven to you that we're likely to have work-life balance and we've proven to you why this is so important. For those reasons, extremely proud to propose. Thanks for the speech. Hello, whenever you're ready. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, Um. yeah, POI is in the chat. Uh, DDM, oh, uh, no, DDM, uh, no preference. And yeah, I'll probably take one POI around five minutes or so. Okay. <clears throat> Turning in three, two, one. Companies only cares about workers insofar as workers provide value. At the point in which the value of a worker generally decreases, it necessarily means that companies are going to ignore them, not give them rights, especially if it's the case that there are alternatives such as automation in and of itself. They tell, PM makes a very serious con uh, concession in their speech. They tell you that competition exists and that's how they're able to, like that's the mechanism in which they're able to get better rights for workers in general. Note that this also happens in sales quo. There's also competition right now between work, uh, between various companies in terms of getting workers in general. That's why currently in corporate, in most corporations, they are willing to give more benefits for workers in general in order to get their better, their workers to not only come over to their company, but stay in their company and not move away. This is why HR department exists anyways. The first question I want to answer is, how did the quiet, uh, quiet quit movement came about in the first place? The reason why it came out in the first place because some people were dissatisfied with their job and as a result, they just didn't really care much. The fact that they felt that there was a lack of opportunities meant, meant that they ended up choosing to quiet quit and become more motivated as a result. This motion in particular is about supporting these people's decision and other people who are in the same exact situation as these individuals. The, this framing is particularly important because it means that not everybody is going to quiet quit. There are going to be some, most individuals aren't going to quiet quit insofar as they aren't in the same exact situations as this group of people. That is to say that for a lot of the benefits of proposition of a government to work, it requires them to prove that everybody will choose to quiet quit, including higher management, et cetera, et cetera. First argument then, why is quiet quitting fundamentally coercive? The reason why is because often people have KPIs that they need to hit. They need to meet these kinds of like KPIs and the amount of output and work that they, that they do generally results in them getting things like salary increments or bonuses that they get that's directly tied to the amount of work that they're able to produce. The problem with quiet quitting, therefore, is that it denies individuals the ability to push, to push for, to pursue this. The reason why is because 
at the point in which your fellow co-workers are putting less effort as a result and your whole department generally has lesser output of work in general, it means that you are less you are less motivated to do well as a result and it also means that your own bonuses are affected by the actions of your fellow co-workers who choose to quiet quit. Note that then this creates a cycle in which you as a worker is also demotivated and choose to pursue quiet quitting because of the, of the actions of your other workers in and of itself. I want to note also that it's difficult to draw the line between what is doing the bare minimum, for instance. For instance, in jobs like HR or like sales, for instance, it's very difficult to tell what is the bare minimum that individuals should do. Oftentimes, most em employers don't really tell, like, can't really give all the directives to their employees, just give the employer a general task and ask the employee to do that task. The point I'm trying to make is that at the point in which workers choose to pursue the minimum effort that they can give, it's likely to be extremely low such that it heavily dissuades other people from putting the most, other people in their own department from putting in the most effort. This is why this particular narrative is this particular like narrative or whatever is coercive. But the problem is that there are some individuals who don't have the ability to, to quiet quit, right? People who rely on bonuses in order to make their money. This looks like, for instance, when you are poor family, when you come from a poor household, for instance, and you need to support many members in your family, you require your yearly bonuses that is tied towards the, the like output of your own company in order to benefit, in order to get money for your own family in the first place, in uh, in the first place. But it also looks like individuals who generally just want to pursue, like, you know higher end goals and get more money in general. Note that this course, this particular narrative denies people the ability to do so. You recognize that like in so far as government tells you that while well, companies don't really have the incentive to do all this kind of bonuses thing, do note if it's true that companies are already in competition with one another to retain workers, then it's a point in which they're likely to want to implement good bonuses and do salary increments anyways, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Second argument, why does this worsen the life of an average worker? And there are three tiers to this. The first tier is about automation in generally, generally, right? Recognize that at the point in which you are demotivated and when you're coerced to be demotivated, you're unlikely to choose to upskill yourself to become more specialist in nature. It's always in the incentive of companies to automate. But at the point in which the productivity of your average worker becomes worse and worse, is a point in which that incentive to automate becomes much greater. This is at the point in which you are likely to hasten automation in the, first, in the workplace. The two problems with this. Firstly, in the event in which automation is hastened, it's unlikely that the government policies will be able to catch up to the point where they're able to like um, deal with large-scale unemployment at the point where automation kicks in. But the second problem also is that you as an individual, because you don't choose to upskill yourself, given the fact that you become demotivated, is to say that you're likely to suffer from the consequences of automation, that you are not like you're likely to be unemployed in the future at the point where you don't have any ability beyond like you know what the robot can necessarily do. And the problem that in this analysis is particularly important because because of the fact that automation will, uh, remains as a viable option for companies to pursue in light of low productivity from their workers, the end result is that as a company, rather than giving your workers more rights, you are more likely to, for instance, automate faster rather than try to listen to what your employees necessarily want. So this also deals with whatever Donald Coase tells you already. The second tier is about HR. Because note that um, when you are in human resource, for instance, like to, in order for you in human resource to generate, uh, what human resource generally does is to make the workplace more competitive. So you offer things like greater, you find greater po uh, insurance policies for your workers and you try to make the workplace generally better. But the point in which certain departments such as HR choose to quiet quit is the point where you don't get these kinds of benefits for your workplace, work department, your workplace in general, just generally decrease in quality. Before I continue, uh, points. Yeah, how do you compete against automation if you are going to be forced to work okay, on the back of the Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah. How are you going to be able to compete against automation if you're the one that's working on manufacturing a line every okay. single day? I'll get to this. But firstly, I just want to note that at the point with some uh, workers upskill, at the, at the very least, people under outside are able to combat automation. But also the fact that I see that companies are less likely to like straight away automate. So the government has more time to create policies for your workers who are affected by automation. The last thing I just want to note is about money, right? The first concept is just that if you are a worker and you get more money from bonuses, you're likely to do better in terms of contributing to things like uh, workers' unions in of itself. But the second thing I want to note is that Insofar as most workers maybe cannot fight back against automation, perhaps they cannot like upskill themselves to be in specialist roles. The comparative is still far better on other on our side. Insofar as they still have more money for themselves in light of automation happening already in the first place. That is to say that even if they do become unemployed in the future, one, this timeline is going to be longer given the fact that companies are less incentivized to do so if their workers are quite productive. But secondly, it's also a fact that you are now able to like have enough money saved up in light of this situation that's a bit ha happening in the first place. 
at the end of this, know that that amount of money can be channeled to your own family and your future generations at the point in which corporations are likely to generally get better in terms of like how they treat workers because of like social movements or whatever. It's a point in which your own children are then able to benefit. For these reasons, we propose. Thank you very much for that speech. Next, let's hear from the Deputy Prime Minister. All right, um, can you hear me? Yep, you're audible. All right, um, you guys in the chat, I'll try taking one at 5.30. Um, yeah, that's it. All right, starting my speech in three, two, one. Side opposition kind of things that if competition exists between companies, then automatically they would give better conditions to the workers. Rather, they can coalesce together and literally maintain the amount of stranglehold that they have in terms of not giving them leeways, not essentially giving, say, for example, benefits to workers because everyone's doing the same. Something that we explained in speech one in terms of asymmetric amount of control that these big corporations have. Like, look at what happened post the GameStop crash. Uh, like, literally, hedge funds filed lawsuits against Robin Hood, simply because of the fact that all of them came together and realized that if there is a potential like disruption to the market that is comparatively more harmful to them. So which means that these large companies also work together to ensure that they can continue the cycle of oppression on these, say, workers, etc., unless and until they get a clear leeway to call them out. I think at that point of time, the controlling of the hegemony that ha happens under the present status quo is one that is largely coercive and not something that's accommodating. That is something that they claim to be. I'm not sure how, why companies are largely likely to be altruistic when they already know that they can go ahead and coerce their workers in terms of when the workers don't know in terms of what the limits of their job essentially look like and in terms of not having proper avenue and access to call out, which we'll get to in a second. Secondly, then they say, in terms of you value the worker, think about it for a second. I think it's like a hedonic treadmill because as Donald explains, it's, it's like your bosses essentially pushing you to go that extra mile every other point of time. Say, for example, them telling you that now today, instead of working till five, you have to work till nine. Guess what? It's a part of your job. This is what you signed up for. This is something that's going to give you a better future. At that point of time, every possible instance or every possible, say for example, target or milestone that you then achieve will be pitched or pinned towards the next possible, like say for example, overwork that you can do, which is at this particular instance, because it becomes like a hedonic cycle. You never know what the boundaries are. At that point of time, I'm not sure how objective valuation can ever be done on the employee in the first place to begin with. Then they say, and this is, I think, the larger part of the argument in terms of there's likelihood of salary increments. And at this point of time, we reduce and take away the choice of people who actually want to work and get this in the first place. The premise of this, like the premise of our argument was fairly simple in response to this, which I think Donald already did. The point is, if there's a system that literally leaves out a chunk of people and does not create a level playing field and does not, say, for example, allow an egalitarian workspace, then that is something that should be discarded. The problem in the present status quo is fairly simple. If overwork, something becomes accessible and like something that becomes the norm and essentially people would be forced to do it. And like, this is not something that only a few people would do that. Everybody would bandwagon on it because at this point of time, your peers are doing it. So I should do it as well. You have a large number of people who will then tend to overlook. The problem is, is asymmetrically screws over a certain group of people. People like, say, women and gender minorities who can't afford to overwork simply because of the, the kind of familial ties that they have in terms of them having to go back home. But also because if you work till 10 or 11 in the night, it's very difficult for you to get public transport back to your home. It becomes like a safety concern for you if you are, say, for example, a gender minority, which is in that particular instance, it becomes difficult for these groups to opt into the system, which is they'll be less and less in incentivized to opt into the workspace simply because they can't meet these standards and can't meet these thresholds of overworking simply because of the problems that exist in society at large. Which means in those circumstances, you leave this group of people out and you essentially reduce the amount of ability for them to self-actualize and go up the ranks. Because if women essentially then can't overwork, can't stay back till 10 or 11, they lose out on promotions, they lose out on salary increments, they lose out on all the perks and benefits that their male counterparts would have access to. I think that's an unfair system and something that you should not essentially opt into. Then they go ahead and 
can say that, well, you want to make extra money if you're on the fringes. I would argue rather that time is a limited resource. That is to say, when you essentially take more, put more time into work, that essentially means you have less time to spend with your family, less time to essentially spend with your friends, which means it's bad for your mental health at the end of the day. So I'm not sure why that trade-off is justified. Lastly, then extraneously, I don't think automation is a voting issue in this debate because all of all they argue is to say, well, the people work a lot and you value them. Now you value them a little bit less. That's why perhaps you'll automate. There's no tipping point of that argument. If companies have to automate, this is a chat GPT plus plus plus, you'll probably automate any day of the week. There's no tipping point that they can prove in terms of what reduction leads to automatic like automation or something in terms of what that inflection point is. I don't think they can prove that. And I don't think that's something that should be a voting issue in this round uh, at the end. What is then a voting issue? What do we think is the problem that we identify? I think under the present status quo, it's very difficult to call these companies out and just call your HR out in the first place to begin with. Because the kind of narratives that operate in society, it's a part of your job. You got to do this. You signed up for this. These are things that are largely likely to be perpetuated simply because there's no clear delineation in terms of to what extent should you work. On our side of the house, you make things more clearer. It's only nine to five. It's 10 assignments that I have to essentially complete, 10 project reports and PPTs that I have to submit, which is companies have to be upfront clear in terms of what their demands from the workers are. But secondly, I think it's very difficult to call your HR out because it creates like a cognitive dissonance. At what point is too much work? At what point should I go ahead and call them out? I think at that particular instance, it creates a dissonance that prevents people from calling other, like say for example, atrocities out. I think this is more likely to happen when those de demarcations are way more clearer, when these things are way more apparent in terms of how they like operate largely in general, which means you don't blur the line. You create this way more objectively. And in those particular instances, you create like a space where more people go ahead and are able to like call these things out and companies are way more likely to be cognizant. If cognizance happens any way that happens on our side of the house, because people have a greater conceptualization of the rights, people know they, in terms of where they actually stand, what have they signed up for and what essentially they should go against. This is way more clear on our side of the house. So it's any kind of organic or structural change happens. The premise to do that is way more clear on our side of the house. You have a clear pathway and a clear reason why you should go ahead and do so. Second part of the argument is fairly simple. I think it creates a better work-life balance because you're able to delineate between work and essentially your family time more. Because this thing, I think as enjoy spending it with your friends and family, go to the bar. The problem with the presence so you have a perpetual hedonic treadmill. You don't know where to stop. You don't know how much to overwork. I think this creates huge amount of mental harm on individuals in terms of essentially like screwing like literally more and more people because of, for example, the amount of kind of workload that they have to deal with. On our side of the house, it's comparatively easier for you to find time for yourself and to find time for your family. Because as we said, time is a limited resource. If we make, say, for example, $10 less, but you get to spend quality time, we think that's a fair trade-off you're willing to buy, even if you don't buy the premise in terms of women and gender minorities do not having the capacity. We think even if there is capacity, we still feel that's a better trade-off to make. Because you're happier as an individual at the end of the day, you know essentially know what your boundaries are. You're more aware in terms of the rights that you have, which is companies can't push like things like non-disclosure agreements and union busting on their on our side of the house because people essentially know comparatively in terms of what they signed up for which means you have a clearer conceptualization of rights people are able to delineate work-life balance better you make it more fairer for gender minorities for those reasons guff all right thank you very much for that speech next is here from the deputy leader of the opposition here here Hi. Yeah. It was a bit choppy just now. Um, could you try Oof. um okay. a sentence just to check? Hi, hello. Um, I am the DLO. Can you hear me? This is a complete sentence. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Lauren. Okay. Awesome. Just give me last ten seconds. Okay, awesome. I'm gonna start my speech in three, 
to one, this debate cannot be about bettering workplace conditions. And there are four reasons why. The first reason is that the very nature of pilot quitting is that you're quitting because you no longer care. So what they're trying to say is, we are all going to strategically quit to the extent in which we can now force corporations to now engage with us on the better side of the negotiating table. I think that's just completely, like, completely unintuitive and completely unreasonable. It doesn't work like that. Like People who quite quit are people who no longer care about their job, but they want to do it to the extent in which it still provides them a living. So it's not like the case that they have this far-sighted like, vision of trying to improve the corporate culture. The second reason is that you can claim that this is potentially a good approach, but you cannot claim collectivization. You cannot claim that everyone will do it. I think that is the burden. You have to just fundamentally prove that this is an option that people can have. I don't think you can outsource it to the fact that everyone will do it and therefore like this is a good thing. And the reason for that is because what they're trying to do is they get to kind of construe to you what support means. So they say support means, hey, we have yet to say everyone will do this. But this is not very feasible in this motion because this motion is not a policy motion. You cannot just make everyone do this thing, particular thing because there's just many places in the world where you cannot afford to quite quit or that's just love the nature of the job. So for example, if you're an actor trying to break into Hollywood, there's just no way for you to like quite quit, right? You cannot just sign up for a decent gig, make some level of living and then go back to like your apartment. You're all trying to have ambitions, right? And I think in that context, it's only on outside of the house that the conception is much more relevant. But the last reason is that even if you claim that you can collectivize, I don't think they can effectively prove that companies will definitely ban. Because companies can respond in a, very, like, a lot of different ways. For example, um, they can automate or they can push forward automation more insofar as like, this is something that they now have to do because workers now literally on like, some kind of like, soft strike. Or they can more simply outsource. Like, which end, they then lose these valuable opportunities for you to support yourself and better yourself. So for all these reasons, I don't think the debate is fundamentally about uh, betting workers condition i think I, I know i told you four reasons i just combined it in three moving on the two contexts i want to add to this debate is that first how are different jobs affected differently and second how are different people affected differently first how are different jobs affected differently so i think this motion actually applies mostly to entry to low level management positions in corporate settings why three reasons the first is that these jobs likely pay you just well enough so that you can conceptualize and afford quiet quitting. Because you're earning slave labor and you're literally not able to quit yourself, you need that job, you can never afford that level of instability, you will not quiet quit. The second reason is that these jobs also have some kind of like progression to it, right? I.e. you have to weigh up the decision to quiet quit. I can do extra things to give me some sort of like progression and rise up the ranks for a promotion. I'm deciding that it's not worth it. So like this is the prerequisite. If you're like literally a child soldier, I don't think the option of like quiet quitting is for you. The last is that there has to be a suitable degree of competitiveness for quiet quitting. So for example, comp like quiet quitting cannot happen in like consulting or like Bosch bracket or investment banking because it's literally anyone else out there willing to take your spot. Even if it's the case that you don't specify this as a working condition, someone else willing to do it for you, that's like setting the norm for the, for the job. So largely, these are the kind of jobs that I think is the most relevant. What is then the significance of this? Look, the observation here is that these jobs are quite empowering for a few reasons. The first is that they're quite accessible. So for example, if you upskill yourself with certification or you try to put yourself through like um, a private school, you can potentially get these jobs. The second is that they pay you quite decently so that you're able to make a living. And the third is that there's some level of progression involved and some like usually the corporate structure empowers you because they want to nurture you as a worker. Maybe it's not the quicker pace possible, but at least it's some level of viability. So these jobs are actually very important for minorities and women who are trying to break into the workplace, trying to break into corporate uh, like maybe they're not like immediate graduates, but like they, they work like somewhere else to make a living for themselves, upskill, and then they get into these jobs. And now these jobs are particularly important for them. The issue here is that at the moment, what you're trying to incentivize people to do is to have like all these like male or privileged individuals who are in the middle to upper class who now have like the affordability to then see on these positions for the nature of just because and it brought these people of this pool to empower themselves. And this has to be the case because it's only the middle class and the upper middle class that has, you know, like the housing concerns at all and some level of stability and some level, level of like um, generational wealth to say, hey, um, I have time for families and hobbies because I can afford, afford these these things, I know about these things from before. Or, hey, like wealth bores me, progression bores me, prestige bores me. Someone who's just fresh out of the slum will not choose to quiet quit because this is the world to him. He is able to access the world and conceptualization that has not existed before. He wants to rise to the highest position possible, but it's in their world that these opportunities no longer exist. Before I go on, I'll tell you why. Yeah, we're not talking about the absolute income someone has, but the amount of effort that they put in relative to the amount that they get back is actually not proportional. Um, I, I do not understand what is the relevance of that POI. Moving on. The second thing I want to talk about is how this affects different people differently. Because even amongst the group that I talked about, I would agree that, yes, there's some level of diversification in terms of demographics. So some workers may be white, male, and super privileged, but some will be women and minorities. Gav say, huh, but if no one overs work, then these people will look better because now, you know, like, it evens out. 
Um, I'm not quite sure how this really happens because I think even in status quo, given that everyone does their job and they're competitive enough to retain that job, then that's likely to be something that they can still hold on to. So like they will still have these jobs, presumably given my characterization of the position that given that like there's some level of training involved in, in like the corporate structure already, given that like experience and expertise is value, eventually they will move up. But I think what they miss out is that these people are the people who cannot participate in the culture of, of, of quiet quitting. And the reason for that is, but as per what they describe, the expectation they have for these workers is a little bit higher. So for example, if you just like intern anywhere, if you just like be in an office, you would know that for example, if there's like a Christmas party, you would give it to the woman in the office and say that, hey, let's take on this extra task because it sounds easier for you to do. These people are also less likely to say no and less capable of saying no, whereas it's the man that says, it's not my job, I don't want to do it. So these people cannot fundamentally participate in your culture. What are the implications of this culture of these people then? The first is that to the extent in which no one else is trying to pick up the extra task, more of these auxiliary duties are then left to these individuals. So no one is trying to volunteer to keep the files clean, to keep the office efficient, to try to like, stock up on supplies, to show practiceness in order to impress their boss. What that means is that this automatically becomes just simple duties that are then assigned to these people. These people then now do it without compensation. It's in fact worse for them. I think the second and worst impact though is on their morale. Because to the extent which they look around and they see, hey, no one cares about me or wants to help because they no longer care about the job. What that means is I'm left with all these duties and that makes it a lot difficult for me to retain my position in this place. And I think the difficult, like the, the analysis here is that the time spent in these positions are valuable because it gives them a certain amount of expertise and skill to be able to exit elsewhere. To the extent in which you overburden them because everyone else quite quit and their job becomes drastically more difficult, they're less likely to be able to stay in this position to attain that tough, like tipping point of promotion or expertise in order to become better and then like do everything else and then leave like, for like better opportunities. So it's that fundamental conception and opportunity um, venue that is no longer accessible. At the end of the day, potentially is the case that workplace conditions are not the best. I think in general though, what we can expect people to do is just try to do their best first and eventually as they have more wealth and money, leave for other jobs, try to change their career pathway and whatever else. Because when they do that, they don't affect other people negatively. And for all these reasons, please side with opposition. Great, thanks very much for that speech. Thanks for sharing from the goblet. Yeah, hi, am I audible? Loud and clear. Okay, uh, PY in the chat, I'll try to take a PY around five minutes. Okay, uh, my time will start three, two, one. I want to do some clarification. What does this motion actually mean? And what is the burden of opposition side? They try to come up a second night and claiming that oh, like this debate is not about majority of workers or like exploitation as a whole, mainly because there's not going to be a lot of people opting into this narrative in the first place. I would like to object that. Number one, if this is a motion that we say that we support this narrative, basically we're discussing the concept of whether this narrative is good or not. In terms of like if we're discussing the concept, then we're probably going to apply this concept in majority of cases and think about if majority of people opt into this concept. This means that the burden for opposition side is to talk about why majority of people opt into this concept. It's is not going to be over more beneficial for people in a society. But secondly, in terms of how we are going to supporting this like this narrative, right? I think it can be like a lot of various forms. It looks like, for example, in the education system you're trying to teach kids that oh you don't necessarily need to do more things and unless that people are more likely going to give you more money like in the contract but secondly it also looks at for example uh, like permanent figures on the media and trying to talk about why like quiet quitting is something is a narrative that we should promote is something that is beneficial for majority of people i think that is probably going to influence a lot of people in a society but i think I think it also looks at, for example, the lying culture, uh, the lying flight culture is currently existing in China, which means that you're more likely going to co-opt those norms into a culture and making people to realize and being informed that this culture, that this narrative exists, and more likely going to be able to operate into this narrative. And that means that they necessarily need to engage with our argument on protecting minorities, also protecting workers and our side. Yeah, but before I'm moving on to defending my argument, I just want to do some weighing and then turn your argument against them. I think like number one, like I would like to take the best case scenario of the opposition side and claim that, oh, maybe there are going to be some poor people that is able to not to do quiet quitting and your side and able to get those bonus and benefit your families. I think there are three reasons why this is ab absolutely detrimental. Number one, this is quite horrible, right? Because there's only going 
going to be 1% of individual that is able to access those bonus. But comparatively, you're going to have 99% of all the other poor workers like constantly competing with you and constantly being exploited by, uh, by the employers. And that exactly means that on utility, we di directly win on scope. But secondly, I think like in terms of like people who are likely going to be able to access those bonus us are not going to be the one that they claim that is being poor and vulnerable. I think it's more likely going to be individual that is quite privileged or like relatively more privileged comparing to the stakeholder that they claim, right? Number one, I think those are going to be the people who have some networks. For example, I know like the employers personally, and that's the reason why I'm more likely going to get those promotions. But secondly, I think like even if this is not true, probably the, there are going to be someone that is able to have higher educations, able to do things more efficiently comparing to you. I've noticed that the people that they are discussing are probably going to be the most marginalized and unlikely going to be able to compete. This means that those people are unlikely going to win the competition and get those bonus under your side. But thirdly, I think the alternative is actually going to be better. I think at the time when you don't necessarily need to overwork so that you can get those bonus, you have more time to do more part-time job, which means that you are able to access more money in the end. I think this wins on two metrics. Number one, you'll have a higher certainty that you can get more money comparing to you probably going to lose the competition under your side. But secondly, I also think there is like side effect in terms of like you can diversify your skills. This means that you're more likely going to be able to compete against automation, more likely going to survive on our side. Second, uh, secondly, in terms of their automation argument, they say that companies more likely going to adopt automation faster uh, if uh, like if we try to do this quite quitting and the government doesn't really have time to respond. Notice, I think there is generally a lack of nuance in this mechanism because the only thing they say is that government doesn't have time to respond. I'm really unclear about why this is true. In terms of like, number one, automation doesn't really happen overnight. You need to adopt new machines. You need to probably purchase and then trying to manage things together, which means that it's probably going to take a while. And at this period of time, if there is like massive amount of workers are going to be replaced, there's probably going to mean that like government needs to do some things and trying to respond to this. But secondly, I think people under our side, if like, Automation is going to be symmetric under both sides. People on our side is more likely going to be able to collective together and trying to lobby the government to uh, adopting things like welfare. But thirdly, even in the worst case scenario, I think like under like their side, they never actually get those benefits, right? Because they simply rely on government to implement policies. But what if the government is corrupted? But what if the government doesn't really have the time to respond anyways? I think the the point here is that like the workers themselves are not able to diversify their own skills. But comparatively, under our side, we don't need to rely on government. If you don't need to work over time, this means that you have more extra time for you to do things like training uh, and taking courses online. It also looks like, for example, you're able to diversify your skills, as I said in the previous speech. And that's exactly the reason why we have more chances for those people to survive under our side. Before I move on, POI. So assuming that productivity does increase, why don't companies just pay you less and hire more people? Uh, yeah, like, if productivity increase, like, why don't people, like, I don't, under, I don't really understand why co corporations will reducing the wages in terms of, like, co like corporation, if corporation reduce the vision and, and they're our side, this is, like, in the best case scenario, this is still going to be comparatively better than you being exploited and you don't get any wages, like, uh, you get minimum wage, uh, like, I think that's just, like, the thing, right? But secondly, even if the wage lowers, not going to be lower than minimum wage, which is the current salary that people are approaching for working class. But lastly, I want to talk about like their uh, rebuttal to us. I'm saying that status quo is not really bad. And then like there is competition mechanism in the, in the status quo. Number one, I think this is a fundamental assault to a lot of like millions of Chinese workers currently working in the manufacturing industries or like Indian workers that is currently like working like uh, eight hours per day. I think there is like, empirically true that a lot of people are being exploited. But secondly, I want to talk about why the competition mechanism is not going to work. Number one, because there is a larger supply compared to demand. Exactly because when they mention automation, exactly because there are a lot of cheap flavors existing in developing countries, this means that the competition mechanism is not going to work because every single corporation has an incentive to exploit workers. But secondly, I think they also leads to race to the bottom. This means that if you don't do more, this means that you're more likely going to lose this job compared to status quo. But then under our side, if we are trying, we are the one that's trying to persuade people that quiet quitting is something that is beneficial, this means that there is a 
higher chances for them to resolve this sort of like problem existing under genocide and more likely going to collectivize together against the, the like exploiters. But also like in terms of like how people more less likely going to be able to suffer because like increasing working tasks or like reducing minimum wage. Because if collective action prob like problem can be solved, this means that there is going to be increasing union power, higher leverage for them to negotiate with the companies, which means that those harms are unlikely going to occur. For all those reasons, propose. Thanks for that speech. Um, off with. Hi, am I audible? Yep, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, starting my speech in three, two, one. The problem with side proposition is that they haven't really proven to us why exactly quiet quitting is the best alternative for these people. Like they. What they necessarily say about where quiet quitting comes from is just that people are kind of unhappy with their unfair working condition, that people are always promised promotions, yet they aren't given this. The thing is that this still doesn't deal with reality, in which a lot of these people can just necessarily quit. There is no clear justification on their side for choosing to want to stay and to choose to want to be disengaged, rather than just having the option where they can quit and they can be promised like better opportunities. What instead is the more realistic and the more probable scenario that side opposition brings to you? We bring to you that the reason why people are more likely to want to quite quit is because they feel like there's a lack of opportunities for them outside, therefore forcing them to stay in their jobs and to just work the bare minimum just so that they can have like a reasonable sum that they are earning over and over and over again. The thing is that on site government, they only talk about people that are like minorities, but in order for their policy to and their case to necessarily work, every single person needs to be able to quit or to quiet quit. But the thing is that on their side, they are necessarily separating these people into like the privilege and the minorities itself. But there's no real incentive for the privileged people to kind of like want to quiet quit in the first place, because at the same time, they're just going to be able to like have all the benefits over time, like because they are the ones that are going to get more money, the ones that are going to get more bonuses, especially because comparatively, if you just look at the workers based Based on value, they are the ones that are more likely to, to be like uh, to be kept on over time and they're more likely to fire the minorities who are going to quiet quit on their side of the world. Therefore, actually worsening the working condition of this uh, of these minorities themselves. Recognize as well that on their side, they never really dealt with the idea that the people that are allowed to quiet quit are people that relatively come from like uh, they are re relatively privileged because minorities, especially in their own phrasing and own characterizations, do not have the capacity or the like have the Sorry, they do not have the capacity in order for them to be able to quiet quit. Because in order to quiet quit, this means that you're okay with taking a significant portion cut. You're okay with not being engaged with work. This means that actually the idea about self-actualizing yourself and having that sense of, like, I guess, purpose at work is not going to be able to decrease on their side for the stakeholders that they necessarily care about the most. What then does side opposition bring to you? We bring to you that the ones that we're talking about are the ones that are going to be disadvantaged in this motion and that two main reasons why this is going to be bad. Firstly, that this is going to worsen those that are affected, uh, those who get affected, because this is just going to demotivate the workplace even further, therefore creating this cycle where people are just unmotivated to do the work and therefore worsening the condition and the productivity of the workplace themselves. Secondly, because in Tan's extension, that wasn't really dealt with within a uh, government with is that this is going to be able to help minorities more because now it's going to be easier for them to break into the corporate industry because there has to be this sort of turnover. This means that what actually happens on their side is that they're just going to stay in these positions. They're not allowing for greater turnover and greater minorities to actually break into this workplace, uh, into this corporate industry themselves, therefore decreasing the amount of like minorities within the workplace industry themselves. Recognize that on-site opposition, we bring to you a much greater scale because on our side, we're going to be able to help minorities to a greater extent and we're going to help them actually um, greater their own work, their own work capacity. The second thing that I want to do is how companies are going to react. Site government says that they have to like is they have this like weird contradiction within their case where they say it at first that it's going to be extremely difficult for people to actually catch on that someone is quite quitting. Yet at the same time, they're using this as a negotiation tool to be able to like work to increase the workplace conditions. We don't see how this is necessarily like going to work on either side because if it's difficult to kind of like catch on, it's difficult to kind of like justify that you know this is something that needs to be increased if it's going to be extremely difficult. You think that if anything, what is more likely to happen is that people are going like sorry, side government lives in a fantasy where suddenly the companies are going to be concerned for you 
you when you don't work less. This is not what reality and actual companies are going to look like. What it's actually going to look like, and this has already been highlighted to you within my previous speakers, is that companies usually view their workers as someone that brings value to them. Therefore, when you decrease the amount of value that you bring, it decreases the justification for them to actually keep you on as a worker. The reason is because there are two main alternatives that the that the companies can use to just replace you. Firstly is the idea of automation. Secondly is the idea about outsourcing. And outsourcing is just going to be worse because now people are actually going to consent into the exploitative, the exploitative um, measures that they're talking about in other industries themselves. Therefore, allowing, you, allowing people in this industry itself to be retrenched. The thing is, that it's extremely difficult for companies to be able to justify keeping these disadvantaged workers who do not have as much values versus on opposition side where they are going to actually try and to upskill themselves. And this actually does two main things. Firstly, because it buys time for government to deal with the issue of automation. Secondly, because it justifies to the company that these people are actually more useful, therefore incentivizing them to keep on these workers on to a greater extent. The thing is that what the government wants to say is that the automation is not necessarily going to be passed and that this idea of the corrupt, go corrupt government, this is the only attempt to kind of like deal with the automation frame that came out within my previous speakers. The, th the thing is that this still doesn't necessarily deal with our case, right? Recognize that this is just extremely dismissive to the thing, to uh, whatever's been brought up to you by my previous speakers. The thing is, what is going to happen is that with automation, like people are already seeing that there's going to be, like we're going to transition into automation. Therefore, when you decrease the justification to actually have like human workers in the industry themselves, the companies are going to more likely want to spend more money into automation because they see this as a more viable outcome and they need it more desperately. Therefore, increasing the time or like not necessarily um talk, not necessarily agreeing with what government whip says about how this is necessarily going to be a slower process. If anything, on our side, despite it maybe not being a slow process, we increase the amount of time for these workers to actually have a job and to actually have some sort of stable income themselves. The second thing that they, that they wanted to push here is that they're going to have more time to be able to do skill upgrade and therefore making them seem more viable because on their side, they just have like all of this, right? No, thank you. The thing is that if they quiet quit, what is the incentive to upgrade? This is the failure that comes from side government, right? Because if they're just quiet quitting and they just want to do the bare minimum, there's no real incentive for these individuals to want to like upgrade themselves and to want to seem more like uh, more productive, more productively viable for these companies themselves. We think that actually what they're going to use for this time is just to do like a lot of random shit, like probably going to sit at home gaming, maybe go out to drink, right? In fact, so like in the best case scenario, we just take them, uh, like whatever that case is, it's just that these individuals are just going to have more time, they're going to be more happy. The problem with this is that this is extremely short-term in nature compared to the long-term the long-term solution that side opposition gives you, in which they're taking this more time to just be happy at the cost of financial stability and the retrenchment in the long term, because there's going to be greater there's going to be greater interest to actually spend more time and more resources into automation or into outsourcing themselves. Therefore, if anything, on site government, they are going to actually make minorities lose out to a greater extent because now they don't have this job and they're unlikely to be one. They're unlikely to upgrade themselves even further if they're always going to stay them. We're always going to stay quite quickly. Therefore, why has opposition win this? Why has opposition won this debate? We think we won this debate because we made it extremely clear the conditions for the quiet quitting themselves to a greater extent than anything that side proposition brings you. Secondly, we think we brought you a much more reasonable uh, explanation of how companies are going to react. Thirdly, we think we're actually going to be able to help minorities more, which is a burden that they necessarily push onto us. For all those reasons, I'm proud to oppose. Thank you for that speech. That concludes the final portion of the debate. To begin the reply speeches, let's invite the neighbor reply. Okay, give me a second. Starting in three, two, one. The first thing I want to do is let's analyze the problem that site government sets up. They tell us companies right now are screwing workers, and there's an industry level problem that they gather together to screw workers' rights in general. Secondly, they tell us that, well, there's a narrative right now that tells workers that they have to overwork. To solve this issue, they propose quiet quitting. The problem is that in light of how serious these issues are that they set up, they, it requires them to prove that a lot of people or a significant amount of people will collectivize to create change. A significant amount of people will gather together in order to quiet quit. quit. We frame this out in this debate really because we really told you that not everybody will quite quit. Specifically, even in the best case scenario, we're talking about like a lot of low income workers, a lot of like manufacturing workers, 
quiet quitting. The problem, therefore, is that your upper management individuals or people working in corporate generally won't quiet quit, which is problematic insofar that you don't get the political change that you want because these workers are very easily replaceable. The fact that they, where the point where they quiet quit, when they lose, when they lower their productivity, is a point where companies either A, choose to automate these workers away or to automate workers and sub or, or bringing machines to like supplement the lesser productivity right now, or B, they choose to like outsource this job to other individuals around the world. Or either that, or they choose to or they choose to like uh decrease the salary of workers in general, but hire more workers to make up for the lesser uh, productivity in nature. All of this necessarily means that they don't get the kinds of changes that they necessarily want under the other side of the house. In all three speakers, they don't prove it. We think that's problematic already. But I think what's particularly damaging to their entire case is what Tan tells you, which Jenny just doesn't really respond to, which is that insofar as we're talking about quiet quitting, the vast majority of people just can't quite quit. The vast majority of sorry, poor workers can't quite quit because they need to work in order to pay for their like families, etc. The problem, therefore, is that the individuals who can quite quit and do tend to quite quit are individuals in the corporate scene who tend to be uh, in entry-level positions in the first place. What therefore happens is that these individuals who quite quit often are, is problematic insofar as it is the position in which they can use to climb this corporate social ladder the furthest and the fastest. So the point where they quite quit is the point in which they don't have any opportunities to climb the social ladder already. The implication of this is a few is a few fold. Firstly, we framed out a lot of the impacts coming out from side government, really. The fact that we told you that, well, this group of workers who, like most of the poor workers, just cannot quite quit in the first place. But I think the more important thing is that we really explain to you why is it that it's particularly problematic in the corporate field. Recognize that if their metric to win this debate is that they want to help, like, gender minorities or people who are generally suffering in the workplace because they can't choose to, or people who live very far from the workplace because they can't overwork, for instance, they make it far worse for the very reason that if you are an individual with privilege, if, for instance, you are a man with all the comparative advantages that Mitra tells you about, you are very unlikely to quiet quit in the first place. In fact, quiet quitting probably makes you look even better because now you are an even more productive worker in the first place and you're likely to get promoted over other minorities within your workplace in and of itself. This is specifically why it's particularly problematic for this group of individuals to quiet quit at all. But note that we are not talking about like mothers, for instance, or people who generally live in far, far across workplaces. Look, for these people, like generally nothing really changes. But what changes is, is for like, for example, your general women, for instance, or your racial minority in the workplace. Those individuals, individuals who generally can climb the corporate ladder, now don't do so because they choose to quiet quit. And as a result, you then empower people with already established privilege from climbing the corporate social media in and of itself. We think that that's problematic. Let's then look at the outcomes in both sides of the house. Look, recognize that insofar as things like automation is going to happen, on the outside of the house, you give greater leeway for like the government to react, right? The fact that companies are not incentivized to push for automation means that the government can provide things like employment benefits in of itself. Their side doesn't do this. And their side only response is to tell us that, well, automation happens in a very long time. No, it's not. Like we're already automating right now, right? There's just not a response, not adequate response in the first place. So you screw over your bottom class workers under their side. But the biggest delta is individuals in the corporate workspaces. Those are the individuals who choose to lose their opportunity to actually climb the social ladder and improve their standings. We think that's regrettable. This is why we oppose. Thank you very much for that speech. Go the play. Mod this way. <clears throat> well, so yeah. Three, two, one. The premise of this debate is still unjustified on the opposition side. Women and ethnic minority safety concern, social narrative that largely benefits men, is still an argument that benefits us. On their side, the best that they can say is that the poor need to, to do this job. But the reality is that poor people already need to work two to three jobs to supplement their income. They need to travel between their jobs and they're already exhausted. Imagine this, uh, the narrative of the opposition side, uh, forcing these people to overwork to try to achieve the KPI, right? If we're using this metric of having higher KPI, this necessarily means that the poor people are going to be losing out because even if they work hard, they're not able to supplement their income if they're living in a city where there's a high cost of living, right? They need a way to find more money. This is why on outside, even if you take the best case of poor people, we're able to win. 
You also note that this is not the characterization that they're they're pushing for in the first place, right? They're talking about poor, they're talking about people who are working hard, trying to become more skilled and more productive. And this is why quiet critique is something that's inherently good. But they cannot also say that these are the people that necessarily have to work in order to sustain themselves. They have to pick one characterization or the other. Secondly, the major push is about collective action problem, which requires everyone to work. This is, isn't true. As long as we can prove that this is a significant this debate and companies worry about this, we already win. How are we able to prove this? On the first speaker, we told you that there's a significant cost to monitor each individual and how they do this. It is also difficult to target quite quick. Are you going to simply fire an entire department? Are you going to have underpaid, overworked middle manager to rat out the person who's quite quitting when a significant number of them is already doing that? I think if you picture this judge, it is oftentimes very difficult to happen. But thirdly, even if the higher level management can temporarily create pressure, once this monitoring stops, they will quite quit. This means that the company will become less competitive compared to others that treat the workers right. This is also going to be true, as Jenny told you, because the workers' uh, unions are going to advertise quiet quitting. Gen Z, to a large degree, is already quiet quitting, and this trend is going to continue. So this means that even if now people are not quite quitting, over time, this is going to quite quit. And this means that, uh, per the analysis from the prime minister, if the wages I pay to my workers overall is lesser than the amount that I, is lesser than um, the weight that they, they, the amount that they produce, this necessarily means that I am put in a dilemma that I, I have to increase the productivity somehow, either to train them hard to make them feel good. They want to, to they want to work for this company. This is the only way they can increase this. Thirdly, the the thing that we still have not been able to um to weigh out is the upfront and demand. Right, I think this is extremely important. Because when you have this information asymmetry, when the boss can simply ask you to work however long and for whatever they want, there's this asymmetry of information. When there's asymmetry of information, the society is justified to take matters into their own hand, be it individual, individual actions or collective action, to, in order to for them to have more information and compensation. Fourthly, utility from work. Opposition's utility largely comes from wages, um, from, from skills that you earn for working hard on jobs. On government side, the ability for you to access a work a target is, is probably applicable to the most amount of people, right? Additional time for you to rest, additional time for you to nurture hobbies, additional time for you to do other things. Why is this important? This is social good. This in decreases the amount of healthcare cost. This also looks like places like South Korea has opted to protect life because of high rates of suicide, because of high societal pressure, right? Thirdly, philosophically, it's also good uh, for you to work in order to have a good life. The worst case scenario on government side, truth be told, is simply to rely on the state and to be a leech to the society, which I don't think that opposition side is able to approve as, as such a bad heart. Lastly then, they say that the debate is not about improving workplace culture, but it's about people no longer caring. Note that this is asserted, no explanation why people simply don't care. The reason why they don't care is because they're working longer hour, but they're not able to be financially secure. But even if this wasn't true, how would on their side, they would have social movement and improvement if they, if on our side, we cannot quite quit. For those reasons, we're extremely proud to take this debate. All right, thank you very much for that speech and thank you everyone for the excellent debate.